maybe today is another celebration who knows so if of course you can guys consider turning your cameras on i really appreciate seeing your faces it also helps me uh, see whether you understand me or not now i would like to remind you guys that all of you should be registered on the my open La uh, math you know that my open math so if you are by some chance not registered, please do so as soon as possible. You cannot take the final exam without doing that. And another thing is you should of course be on my email list. Good. Let's review what we have talked about last time. So we began taking the derivative of exponential functions. And uh, we observed that there are two definitions. Do you remember the two definitions, guys? There is this definition, which tells you that the derivative of a function is at the point x, its limit as z goes to x of fz minus fx over z minus x. What is the definition saying? It's just saying calculate the slope using two points where the point uh, whose, whose horizontal coordinate is z is brought to the point whose, co whose horizontal coordinate is x. And there is another definition, definition two, that tells you that you can write it this way. You can say that the point z can be written as x plus some residual. It's not exactly x. So it would be h here, f of x plus h minus f of x, where h is the difference between the horizontal coordinates of the fixed point and the point that we slide towards x. I hope you understand that those two definitions are logically the same, but psychologically they can evoke different responses, different insights. And so for, for the derivative of an exponential function, we began with the second definition. That's the first time where the second definition seems better. And so here you can say that we do that because it seems that if the exponential rules are true, I can factor a to the power of x plus h into a to the x times a to the h minus a to the x. Yes? Which what? When, if I factor it out, I am able to remove a to the x and I have this limit. It's limit as h goes to zero of a to the zero plus h minus a to the zero divided by h, which means that I started taking the derivative at an arbitrary point x and ended taking the derivative at the point zero. And what else do I conclude? I notice that of course the derivative of an exponential function isn't very different from the exponential function. It's essentially the same function. Do you see that guys? In other words, even without figuring this limit, I know that it will be some number. So the derivative of a to the x is a to the x times some number. By using a calculator, since we could not figure out what this thing is exactly, by using a calculator, we estimated that this number for two to the x is 0 0.693 or approximately 0 0.69. That means what? That means if I want to take uh, uh, the derivative of two to the x, it becomes two to the x times 0 0.69 approximately. And if I want to take derivative again, it will be two to the x times 0 0.69 squared and so forth. If I take the derivative again, it will be cubed. You see that, guys. Now, of course, uh, you can try, guys. Is it easy to take 0 0.69 squared 
or cubed or to the fourth power, it is not as simple, right? I mean, the bigger the power, the more trouble you have. It will take you longer and longer and longer to carry out that calculation. So it's not so pleasant to multiply by this number. If you were to play around with three to the X, you would have gotten a different number. With three to the X, it would have been roughly 1.099. And in, in each situation, we see the number, uh, in one case, it was slightly below zero, sorry, below one, and then slightly above one. But in, in each of those cases, uh, this multiplication is somewhat complicated. And then if you remember in the last lecture, we concluded that the best number uh, we can hope for is what? When we take the derivative, the best number to multiply by is by one number, exactly. You all see that, yes, guys, why by one? so trivial because multiplying by one doesn't take any effort. If you multiply by a number more than one, you would have to use maybe, if you have a calculator, you're too kind of uh, accustomed to it, right? The calculator also has some sort of problem. You just relegate the computation to something else. But whatever is computing, it's much easier to multiply by one than by any other non-zero number. So you understand guys, so in this quest, we realized that uh, we hope, right? We hope that this is a hypothesis. You understand it's entirely, there, there are many things here that are completely unknown. Uh, we are hoping that there will be a number, hypothetical number between two and three, and we call it E, uh, for which uh, the limit is going to equal to one. In particular, this limit, E to the H minus one over H is equal to one. So we are hoping that such number can be found. Right? You, you, why do we say it's between two and three? Because when you play around, you can see that uh, two is too small, three is too large, and you can kind of maybe take 2.5 and you will find it's too small, but 2.8 is too large. You understand, right? So you can just uh, search for that number and uh, by experiment, perhaps you can think, uh, well, the number is somewhere in this range. Now, of course, even this calculation, I mean, uh, it is not a, a lawful calculation because, I mean, we used, uh, we used a lot of approximations and a lot of subjectivity, right? We cannot take, I, I think you are not aware of how to calculate root of two, much less uh, one thousandth root of two. And there are other problems. <clears throat> But if uh, a function, guys, it is e to the x, if such a, a unicorn, if e to the x to, to exist, I say unicorn because it's a mythical creature until you have verified its uh, presence, like Bigfoot, does it, is it there in the forest or not? So what are the features of that function that, uh, that we should hope to find? What are the features is that <clears throat> if a function e to the x exists, you would say the derivative of e to the x is going to be what, please, write in the comment. If this function exists, the derivative is what exactly? <clears throat> I'm waiting for comments. There should be like a 25 of them because your response should be like when a doctor hits you on the knee with a hammer, it's so obvious. one or e to the e to the x exactly right the derivative is e to the x because the derivative at zero is six so it would be e to the x times one in other words it is e to the x so this function is it's gonna have if this function exists whatever that function is we are we are looking at a function of the form take the derivative and the function is not changed yes now because we were dealing with exponentials, I'm just kind of abstractly saying, what are the functions whose derivatives are not changing them? And also inspired by e to the x, I might make the stipulation that f of zero is equal to one, because you think, for example, that any number, any exponent to the zero is like maybe a to the one divided by a to the one, which is uh, a to the one minus one which uh, should be, if things are right, should be one. So we, we see that um, the exponent of zero should, <coughs> should make it one. Agreed? Now guys, 
what do you know about uh, about the derivative, right? What is the derivative report? So if I know the derivative, I can feel the, the, the shape of the curve. Derivative tells me the slope of the line segments. You see what the, the picture that you should have here is that the curve, like take any curve here, right? What is this curve? The curve is uh, a sequence of line segments. Right? So over this X, uh, this, is the, this, uh, this is the slope. The derivative reports the slope. Right? So what can you say about two curves, guys? So, so abstractly, so this is uh, the graph uh, Y equal f of x. What would you say about the curve? If, if this is y equals to f of x, imagine that uh, we have another curve not seen on the graph, but the derivative g of x equals to the derivative of fx. Uh, what can you say about g? If this is the curve f of x, here I gave you a big hint. You see it's made of uh, line segments, just make those line segments microscopic. And uh, we are saying, well, suppose we have another curve and its derivative is the same. What can you say about the curve g? How does it look like if you see the curve f? Right, you know, what, what, what can you say about them? Yes. Aaron says it, but what about the rest of you guys, right? Don't fall asleep here. What's the reason? Well, obviously also a curve, right? The curve is anything essentially, right? Intuition guys, what do you have here? You understand what the derivative is reporting. You, you think of a curve as made of line segments and the derivative reports the orientation of the line segments, its slope, right? So here is a bigger derivative, bigger derivative. This derivative is zero, you understand? So the derivative of the curve is like you have infinitely small line segments and for each line segment the f prime is just a report of the slope of that line segment so if that derivative is the same what can you say about that curve think about it very simply guys what can you say about two lines whose uh, whose slopes are the same right equality equality is a possibility, but not necessarily. If you have parallel, that's the word you're searching for, right? Not equal necessarily, but parallel. If you have the same slope, you can have parallel lines. Do you understand, guys? I'm trying to, to just, if you think what derivative is, it's a slope. So when you say that two derivatives, it's very important. It will be extremely important later in integral calculus, but I want you to see it right away. It's obvious. If the derivative is the same, look at it. So here it is, you see, uh, then it could be a parallel curve because if the derivative at any point X the same, that means the slope at that point is the same. Yes? Do you understand what, guys, it's gonna be extremely important in a moment I hope you can all appreciate it, right? If not, I mean, of course, after class uh, remain, we will finish it. Do you understand how I reason, guys? What, what do I want from you, right? I want you to not just uh, memorize some stupid formulas that's completely useless. I want you to reason using calculus. A curve is just uh, a chain of very small line segments. The derivative is just the slope of those line segments. So what immediately follows? So if two, if two curves have the same derivative, that means that uh, anywhere you look at, the, at any um, microscopic line segment, they are parallel. And if those line segments are parallel, those, uh, those, those curves are either the same curve as uh, Cillian, I think said, or uh, it's shifted up or down because for the same X, I mean, you see, uh, for the same X, you have the same slope. For the same X, you have the same slope anywhere, right? So that means that over that same X, the line segment is oriented in the same way, it could be up or down. So if I specify uh, one curve uh, uh, that uh, agrees with another at one point and everywhere else it's parallel, then the curves are the same. You will see in a moment what I mean, don't worry, good? 
So here is uh, what we are going to do now, guys. So abstractly speaking, we are going to now re-investigate this problem. For a moment, we can forget that there is such a thing as exponential map. We can think we don't really understand exponential maps because we don't understand. You see, guys, why do we not understand exponential maps? Well, we understand maybe uh, what is two squared or what is two cubed, but do we understand uh, what is two to the power of one half or even worse, what is two to the power of root two? What does it even mean? So there are a lot of things about exponential maps that are mysterious to us. But derivatives are much simpler. Derivatives, we understand slopes of lines very well, right? So inspired by the fact that it appears that exponential functions don't change much under derivative, and there might be an exponential function that doesn't change at all under the derivative, I begin investigating this question, which functions if they are not, uh, what would they look like? If a function does not uh, change under derivative and at zero it equals to one, I make this stipulation. I could make at zero and make it the function at zero equal to anything, you see? It's the y-intercept. F of zero is the y-intercept. Remember what you need for a line, guys. You need the slope and you need a y-intercept. If you have a y-intercept that determines a unique line. So similarly for any uh, set of parallel curves, if I know the slope everywhere and I know the y-intercept, I know that curve and I select this y-intercept to be zero. That's the ins inspiration is that uh, e to the zero is one. You understand? The inspiration exponential to the zero is one. I'm hoping to find out what that function is. So my first question is of course, could it be a polynomial? Could such a function be a polynomial? Remind me guys, what, what am I asking in my question? Could such function do what? or B1. I'm asking you guys again, what, I'm asking you, what does it mean for a function to be a polynomial? Do you understand that question? So is a function whose derivative is not changing it and at zero it equals to one, could such a function be a polynomial? To understand this, to answer this question, you first have to know what am I asking? Can I do what? Can I simulate what the function is doing, how it digests its input by using only, you finish my sentence. Multiplication and addition, precisely. Very good, addition and multiplication. Now, is a function whose derivative is not changing it a polynomial? For that, you need to know something about polynomials. Notice that the, how would you investigate? This function is not changing under derivatives. You agree? Take the derivative, it's not affecting this function. So naturally you can ask, does derivatives affect polynomials? Do they change them? Let me help you. What do I mean? Could, uh, the, uh, say, here is the function. If you want to, you, you can think that it's e to the x, if you have to uh, imagine what it is, okay? But in general, uh, all I know about this function, it's one, I know that its derivative will keep the same function. It will not change anything. And two, the function at zero is equal to one. That's all I know about it. Could that function be a polynomial? That's what I'm asking. Could it be a quadratic polynomial, right? So let's suppose, let's take a quadratic polynomial of P of X equal to some A zero plus A one X plus 
a to x squared, could it be that the function f of x equal, equals to that polynomial? Is that possible? No. You guys, it should be immediate. You see, it's like I'm asking you, does a giraffe have scales? It should be as obvious like this. Look at it. What happens if I take the derivative of p to the x once? I take the derivative, I get a1 plus 2a2x. Yes? And I take the derivative again, and I get 2a2. And I take the derivative again, and I get 0. So take three derivatives, and the polynomial disappears to 0. Isn't it obvious, right? Now, this function, f, and the derivative, it doesn't change. So take one derivative, it's the same. Take two derivatives, it's just like the derivative uh, of f prime, which is the derivative of f, which is the same. And as you can see, if I take three derivatives, it will be the same. As they say, in Russian, like water from a goose's feather. It doesn't change the function. So could it be a quadratic? The obvious answer is it cannot. You with me guys, right? I'm not just talking to myself. It's completely obvious, yes? Yes? Because uh, some of my question is here is a hammer. What do you do with a hammer? You hammer a nail, right? What is a nail? It's something that you hammer, right? So I'm asking you something that should be as obvious to you as a hammer or a nail. Just here, the hammer is derivative. So it cannot be a quadratic polynomial because after three derivatives, quadratics disappear to zero. And this function after three derivatives never disappears. So I find a distinction. Could it be a cubic polynomial? Could it be a polynomial of degree three? You see what I'm saying? Could it be any formula that involves a degree three polynomial? <clears throat> hmm? Okay. Degree three polynomial, guys, if you understood it, uh, what, what is a degree three polynomial? It means the polynomial of degree three is uh, something of the form a zero plus a one x plus a two x squared plus a three x cubed. Can it be degree three polynomial? What happens if I take uh, if I take four uh, four derivatives of this function? What happens if I take uh, each time I take the derivative, the power decreases, right? The cube becomes square one derivative, then the square becomes one power. Are you with me? So after you take derivatives, it disappears to zero. After four derivatives, it isn't it obvious? And this function, it, it will not be decreased because it's not reacting to derivatives. Yes? You look very sad, I don't know why. Do you follow me, guys? Wait, Professor, can you say that again? It just got disconnected and I was just a little bit. Is my connection good enough? Is that a problem? No, no, uh, my, I think it's on my end. So if you could say oh. that again, I apologize. Okay. Oh, okay, so I'm saying that degree three polynomials, right? If you take four derivatives, they vanish to zero. Do you see that? Guys, you see that uh, we, we have, we learned how to take derivatives of polynomials, I think just uh, very recently. Yes? So take derivatives, it will make the, it will make the polynomial vanish. Take one derivative, it's decreasing by degree. Uh, take another derivative, one more degree is reduced. And on and on and on until the polynomial is gone, but the function stays around. 
Yes? So it cannot be degree three polynomial. Can it be degree million polynomial? Type in the comments, of course, if you say yes or no, but why is what, what I'm interested in. Why? Right, maybe you can say no, but why not? After how many derivatives is a, a polynomial of degree 1 million disappears to zero? How many derivatives do you take to reduce it to zero? A degree million polynomial to four? No, no, you would, you would have to take more derivatives than that. The biggest term is x to the million. How many derivatives will you need to take for the entire thing to vanish? Million and one. So any polynomial of finite degree will disappear after enough derivatives. So it cannot be a polynomial of finite degree. Another thing is maybe you don't understand why I am so interested about functions that uh, don't disappear when you take uh, derivatives. So don't change when you take derivatives. So let me tell you what's the intuition. Imagine you come to a poltergeist. Do you know the word uh, pol house uh, haunted by a ghost? It's a German word, poltergeist. Poltergeist to kind of touch, right? So you see weird things there. You see. Uh, you see a piano standing upside down on top of a chair. Yes, you see all the dishes uh, smashed against the wall. All the furniture is upside down, right? If you are a ghost hunter, you know what you're impressed by? What do you look at? You don't look at what the uh, ghost touched, but you look, well, there is, a, there is an old family photograph, you know, from the 19th century and that photograph did not move, did not, it was not touched. There was no cracks. It was not damaged. You understand that? You pay, you understand the ghost, the poltergeist, if you see what the poltergeist doesn't touch, doesn't bother. So our poltergeist is the derivative. Does it touch polynomials? Yes, it does. Does it touch other functions? Yes, many functions are changed. Uh, they are thrown around. But what does it, but, but if I understand what the derivative doesn't change, that's very important. That's a key to understanding the poltergeist. Same as for those movies, guys, same is true for mathematics. You need to understand, and I can, if you have patience or interest, I can show you how important is e to the x. What's important about it is that under derivatives, it is not changed. Good? You're, you're clear what I'm saying, guys? So let's look at, uh, at my lecture. So we see guys that it cannot be a polynomial of finite degree, but of course polynomials, we love them. It's, the, it's our best thing that to have. So we cannot have a finite polynomial guys. You see if this, if it's a polynomial of degree N, take N plus one derivatives and the polynomial vanishes. So here is the leap of faith. I'm interested if you can make it guys, if I, really want it to be a polynomial and I cannot make it a finite polynomial. What do I do? Right, obviously uh, finite polynomials are destroyed by derivatives. So this function that is not affected by derivative cannot be a finite polynomial, but I really want it to be a polynomial. What do I do? Consider an infinite polynomial, precisely that. So what I'm showing you guys is extremely important. Consider an infinite polynomial, whatever that means, we can investigate later. But uh, if it's an infinite polynomial, then it looks like this. You see, it does not have an ending term. You see, it's some coefficient plus some coefficient times X plus some coefficient times X squared and onwards. In Calc 2, you, you would call such a thing power series, but power series uh, belies the fact that it's just a polynomial. It's, it's a bad name, I think. You see, it's an infinite polynomial. That's what's so special about it. Okay, so this is an infinite polynomial. 
and I imagine that this function equals to it. Now, if, if I can be successful, then I want to know what are the coefficients. If this is true, then what are the coefficients? What is a zero? What is a one? What is a two? What is a three? And so forth. Yes, what are those coefficients? So before we talk about those coefficients, let me remind you guys of what is n factorial. So if you take three factorial, that means you multiply uh, all the numbers from three going backwards towards one. So it's three times two times one. Five factorial is five times four times three times two times one. And n factorial, you just go from the integer n all the way to one and multiply all the integers, all the consecutive integers. You understand that's n factorial, clear? Zero factorial is defined to be one. Now, again, guys, here is all we know about this function. We know that at zero, it's one, and the derivative is not changing it. How would you find out, look, look at it here. How would you find out what is a zero equal to? Can anybody have a guess? A very easy way to figure out what's a zero equal to. All we, it's very easy, guys. There are very few options. It's like a what, when, where game, right? The function, we only know what it is at zero. At zero, it's equal to one. And we know it's not changing under derivatives. So how do you find the coefficient a zero? Can you help me? It's almost like this, guys. Uh, I, I ask you to, you know, it's an escape room, right? And I say, the only thing you can do is, and, right? So what are you gonna start doing if that's the only thing you can do? <laughs> Same thing, <laughs> you see, the question is obviously already there. The answer is in the question. What do you do? Take it to some power of x. Um, what do we know about the function? At zero, it's one. And we know derivatives don't change it. So what do you do, guys? <laughs> it's like I say, right? You either can pull your tongue out or pull the ears. And I ask you, what do you do? And you say, and you uh, decide to take a third option. So yeah, so all you do, guys, is just plug in zero. Plug in zero, look what happens if I plug in zero here. Each X here will be annihilated except for the constant term. And plugging zero here will give you one. Isn't it obvious? One is equal to F of zero. Everything here is zero. So you have that A zero is one. The, the constant term is one, wasn't it simple? This function at zero is one, right? I, I use that fact, very easy, yes? Now a more challenging question, guys, how do I find the next coefficient? How do I find a one? How do I find a one? Remember, big hint, all you can know about this function is derivatives and plugging in zero. You see, Moshe, you, you plug in one. What will it help you if you plug in one? A F of one, you don't know it. Right, so how are you gonna set up an equation? And if you plug one in the polynomial case, you have uh, a zero plus a one plus a two plus a three, etc. What do you do? Plugging in zero gives you a zero, but doesn't give you exactly, Aaron, right? You take the derivative of the function and then plug zero. Use the other option. Why does it work? Why does it work? Look at it, take the derivative. The derivative of this function is the function itself, no change, do you agree? Do you see that guys, no change? But if I take the derivative of this infinite polynomial and forgetting about the difficulties, assume it works the same way as with finite polynomial that I take derivative term by term. What's happening here? Derivative of a zero is zero. Derivative of a one X is a one. Derivative of a2x squared is 2a2x. Do you see what happens, guys? And this derivative must still be the same function. Are you with me? It's trivial, right, guys? Do you see, look, think of it, guys. You can only take derivatives of this function and plug in zero, because those are the only things that seem to be giving anything to us. Are you with me? 
I give you two options and uh, I say here is door A and door B and what, do you want to hit your head in the wall? So what do we have here? So plugging zero now into the derivative, look at it, the derivative is the same as uh, the function. So one is equal to f prime of zero. And here everything is annihilated except for, uh, for the first, uh, for the second term for a one. So we have a one is equal to one. Now, how do I find the coefficient a two? Help me find the coefficient a two. What is a two? Okay, let's wait for others. Okay, John, zero for the second derivative function. Do you see what happens, guys? When you take the derivative, you can make one term, in taking off derivatives, you can make one term be constant and everything else has X afterwards, yes? Well, guys, I see you begin disappearing. Uh, maybe Christian Casimir, if you're around, turn the camera on. I would be happy to see you if it's possible. Sandra Zdusik would be nice to see you. Nicole, not naturally. Dorian, all of you, if you can, guys, turn cameras on so that I can uh, uh, see what you're doing and so it's not boring. Moshe, Janisa, Safa, all of you guys. Come on. Thank you. Sure, Moshe, okay. Hey guys, if it's very, very uncomfortable, I do my best to understand, right? But don't uh, use my good nature against me. What are we doing? I asked you to find coefficient A2. What's the coefficient? Jeffrey, you got it. Sure, Sarah, no worries. Guys, I showed you how to hammer one uh, nail into the wall. Then I showed you how to hammer the second nail to the wall. Now I say hammer the third one, right? All right, no, then no, let's do it together then. Yes, just very good. So take another derivative, take two derivatives, guys, take two derivatives. Here is the first derivative, we obtained it uh, from the previous line, right? Here is the first derivative. Take another derivative, this coefficient disappears and we're left with 2a2 and then three times 2a3x and everything afterwards has an x. The, the derivative made the infinite polynomial appear to look differently 
but the function was not changed. Do you agree? And I pushed 2a2 to the first position. And look at it, what happens now. Now, if I plug zero, everything here is annihilated. It's still this, this new der this derivative did not change my, poly my, my uh, function. It's not changing other derivatives. It's the same f of x. Plug in zero, you are left with 2a2, but plugging in zero into this function gives you one. Do you see, guys? So I have the equation one equals to two times a2, which means a2 is equal to one half. Here is that line, guys. I want you to, here is the line of the second derivative. Now I want you to tell me what is the coefficient of a3. What does a3 equal to? Look at the equation carefully, Jeffrey. This is the second derivative. What's the strategy, guys? Do you understand the strategy? You have this polynomial by taking derivatives, you can push the terms forward. Yes? Push the terms forward. First, it was a zero. Constant term disappears when you take the derivative. The power of x diminishes and pushes the coefficient of that x closer to the constant place. Yes, just spirit. Good, it's one six. Good, Moshe. Good, Jeffrey. Clear, amazing. I'm waiting. Very good. I'm still waiting for most of the class. What's the, what's I see? Well, I didn't say that Jamal, right? Uh, you, you assumed that. Uh, let's, we, we're going to, we're going to derive the general uh, situation, the general uh, statement. Guys, do you understand what I'm doing? I'm doing the most natural thing possible, right? If I can only plug zero and, and take derivatives and for that I know the value of F, then I'm gonna do the same thing for the uh, right hand side. And besides, it's very easy to take derivatives of polynomials and plugging in zero eliminates the terms. Yes? So what do I do next? Look at it. Take the derivative. Do you see this guys? Look, look, look what, where, where, where we're at this line. Take the derivative. The first term disappears. Take the derivative here. One comes down and that's x to the zero. Everything else has an x. So it will be three times two times one. That's why it's one over three factorial. You see, I have this, uh, take plug in zero, you get three times two times one times a three is equal because three derivatives of the function is the same as not taking any derivatives and plugging zero. You see, if I take three derivatives and plug zero, I obtain the same exact thing if I don't take any derivatives and plug zero. That's why I know it's one. You with me? So I see that uh, a three is equal to one over three factorial. Now, what's the situation in general, guys? Well, let me try to do it this way. So the function is f of x equal to something, I don't care. Here we have the term a n, x to the power of n, and something afterwards. I just want to figure out a n, right? What will I do? Just to figure out some arbitrary coefficient a n. So how many derivatives do I need to take to bring it uh, to a constant term? Look at it. I take one derivative. So one derivative, it remains the function f of x is equal to blah, blah, blah. But this term is n a n x to the n minus one. Yes. 
Now I take another derivative, it's still f of x, two derivatives, and what do I get? I get uh, n, n minus one, a n x to the n minus two. You agree? You see what I'm doing? When the n minus two, I'm pushing it to the, to the left. Yes? Now, how many derivatives do I take be, uh, and, until that very moment where the x disappears entirely? You see, we have n, n minus one, I'm using the power rule. Do you remember it, guys, from uh, previous lecture? The power rule. Derivative of x squared is two x. Derivative of x cubed is three x squared. Right, I'm dropping the power down. So take more derivatives. Well, how many derivatives do I need to take to make x disappear? But the, but the coefficient's still there n plus one will make it zero. Uh, so I need to take n derivatives, right? So if I take n derivatives, look at it. So, uh, so f of x equal to f n x, which would be equal to n, it will be, look at it, n minus two, it will be n factorial, a to the n x to the power of zero, because I, I borrowed everything. I took the n, I took the uh, n minus one, all of them, yes? I'm showing you guys something really incredible that you would, if you of course be using this to think, you will be using it all the time. What is it n to? What do you mean n to? Uh, it is just an arbitrary coefficient. It's like this, this way I can figure out uh, a one, a zero, a one, a two, I, I, I'm telling you what to do in a, for a general term, right? So this is simply n factorial a n. And so I, uh, uh, you know, plus, I mean, at zero, at zero, this is so, at zero. So it's this. And so we have that f of zero is equal to one, which is equal to n factorial a n. Yes. So what is a n? So we have that a n equals to one divided by n factorial. Yes. Here is the previous slide. You don't need that slide guys. You see, uh, what do you need the slide for? Do you, do you, you see, if you need the slide, you don't remember it. If you don't remember it, it means you don't understand it. It's very simple. You understand the derivative, you understand what derivatives do. We're investigating a function that doesn't change under derivatives. And we want to know if it's a polynomial. It's not a finite polynomial. Let make it, let's make it an infinite polynomial just because we love polynomials so much. I can see on your faces, my God, you're, you're in love with polynomials. So yes, those are very inspiring expressions there. So it's an infinite polynomial, then what are the coefficients? I figure the coefficients by taking derivatives and plugging in zero. And here is what we get, guys. I get that this function, I get that this function is equal to one plus x plus one half x squared plus one over three factorial x cubed plus one over four factorial x to the fourth and so on and so forth, okay? Does it work? Well, obviously if I plug zero, it will be one. If we plug zero, only one survives here, right? So f of zero is one. Now, if I take the derivative, here is just a calculation. Take the derivative, you get the original function. Yes, it does work. This infinite polynomial represents, well, of course we made it work, right? This infinite polynomial, when you take its derivative, it looks the same way. Doesn't change, okay? Now, let's look for a second, guys. Now, look at it. It is, guys, it will, it must be, if, if, if there is this, because we, we found entirely, you see, this is only one polynomial. There is only one function accordingly, right? Only one function that at zero equals one, 
and its derivative is itself. Why do I think it's one function? Because here is the formula for that function, you see? That formula cannot be equal to two functions. That therefore, that must be e to the x. Do you understand what I'm saying, guys? It must be e to the x, right? e to the power, e to the zero equals to one. It has to be e to the x. I'm of course making it a bit more, you know, I mean, I'm not sure what, you're, what you imagine, guys. I'm trying to think, to tell, to show you how I use this mathematics to be absolutely convinced of however scary this result might look. It's not very scary actually, but I am absolutely convinced now that I found e to the x. I could not have found anything else. Do you understand why, right? Uh, there is only one function that at zero equals to one and its derivative is itself. That's the formula for it. If, if e to the x, that mythical creature uh, exists, if there is an exponential function that behaves this way, it must be equal to that infinite polynomial. You understand what I'm saying? I'll show you afterwards the option. Now let's look at the magic guys. Uh, what is that number uh, that to some power h minus one over h will produce one. I can use that formula to figure it out. Just plug instead of x, plug one. Look at it. I plug uh, a one instead of uh, hx and I have one plus one plus one half plus one over three factorial and onwards. Now, if I don't want to sum forever, let me sum only up to the one over five factorial. Do you see that guys? If you sum it up, you get something like 2.71. Remember I mentioned the number will be between uh, uh, two and three. And without even using calculators, without anything, I right away can use this idea and I can figure out what that number is. Isn't it amazing? Right, it was not calculation that made it, it's just a complete uh, logical reasoning there, right? So look at it, I have, this is my number. If I play with a calculator with 2.71 and I plug in an approximation to zero, I get 0 0.997. Now, if I add one more term, Let's say I may I, I add one over six factorial. Now I have two point seven one eight. Well, I, I disappear. I plug one. Look at it. Instead of x, I plug one. Do you see? E to the x is one plus x. So what, if I plug one here, it would be one plus one plus one half plus one uh, over three factorial. Do you see that, guys? Now, x does not disappear. I replace x by one to represent e. What about uh, one half? Uh, what do you mean, uh, Safa? What, what do you mean, what about one half? Where is the one half coming from? One half is one over two factorial. Well, look at it. Here is one plus X plug in one here. So that's the, what the one half. It's one half times one to the square. One th over three factorial, one cubed. Plug in. a little bit, expand it a bit more and you get 2.718. And if you play with your calculator, look, it's 1.000396. Okay, this is known as Taylor series, this process. You understand, I just uh, evaded the problem of finding the limit, I created that number, right? I'm creating it as I introduce the terms. Because the derivative has to be equal to the function itself, that means uh, that, um, that, 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 would force, uh, that would force it to be, if there is an e to the x, it would force it to be that e. I'm finding that number. And in general, guys, uh, you can actually, if you want to read this section, it tells you how to find those coefficients in general. For maybe, maybe for extra credit, when we talk about trigonometric functions, we will ask whether trigonometric functions are polynomials. And we will see what we know about trigonometry to produce uh, this process, you understand? Those are very, very powerful techniques. Now, uh, there, there are optional uh, section here. So the function is defined to be this. This is just the infinite sum of x to the n over n factorial. That's the one plus x plus x squared over two factorial plus x cubed over three factorial. You can just write it in this very nice compact form. Okay, this just means start with n zero and then upgrade it uh, sequentially plus one and plus one and plus one and plus one, you just zero. One, two, three, four, you just plug instead of the n and you obtain that long summation. Clear? Now, I'm not gonna talk about it because you don't know binomial theorem and I don't want to torture you too much, but you understand, I just found the, the fact, the e to the x, I just said, if, if there is such a function, then it must be that infinite polynomial. I still haven't proved uh, that there is such an exponential function. You understand? I don't understand exponentials very well anyhow. 
or you don't understand exponentials very well to be precise, right? Because why, 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 why don't you understand exponentials very well, guys? Because if you did, I mean, you understand maybe uh, two squared, but you don't understand what is two to the power of root two or what is two to the power of pi. And you definitely cannot explain well to me why it's two uh, to the power of X plus Y equal to two to the X, two to the Y. You can only prove that property, I bet, if you can prove it at all for positive integers or for, for any integers, maybe if you work, right? You, and you cannot even prove it to me for fractions, I bet. Which means you don't understand that property. Okay, so if you actually follow uh, this development, that's one way to do that. If you follow this development, I can show you that e to the any any real number, just e to the x is just uh, forgetting about what it means. I just I'm saying f of x times f of y. That's going to be that property uh, that, that I will prove. Uh, that f of x times f of y must be f of x plus y. That's the exponent law without mentioning that it's an exponential. That's optional if you want to. This is not statistics, this is analysis, but, uh, but some ideas uh, I explain in, uh, because I use the binomial theorem, right? And I'm not sure if you know the binomial theorem. You can read my statistics notes and you can see what it is. Okay, I, 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 don't, I didn't teach it in this class. So that's why, that's one reason I do not uh, go over it. So here is the thing guys, if, uh, what I'm saying is that this is just a, a representation for the function, right? And if I uh, multiply the power series, I will see that the result is, uh, is here, right? Is that it, it has the exponent laws and here I show for integers, it behaves like an exponential function. And for fractions, it behaves like an exponential function. You understand? I'm actually, I can, I can use that infinite series, infinite polynomial to extract the exponential rules to prove to you that those exponentials rule, rules hold for all numbers. And whereas before you didn't understand what it means to plug in root of two with an infinite polynomial, it's very easy. What is, uh, what is e to the root two? Just plug instead of the x root two, you understand? So for, for somebody who studied calculus, what does this thing mean? This thing simply means one plus x plus forgetting about this, this symbol is almost meaningless. The fact that it's above, it doesn't matter. It just means to me, one plus X plus one half X squared and so on, right? And I know how to plug anything in here, any real number. So if I want to calculate E to the power of root two, right? Uh, what do I do? I say one plus root two plus one half root two squared and onwards, right? If I also want to calculate E cubed, I don't think of it as e times e times e. I rather think of it as one plus, uh, plus three plus one half three squared and onwards, which ends up being the same as if you, uh, it ends up being the same as taking 2.718 blah, 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 and uh, multiplying it uh, by itself three times. That I prove. You understand guys, I'm, I'm imagining your brain, your blood from your brain is draining, right? And you feel like you are in a negative or positive G-force, whichever is worse. Positive G-force, right? And, the, and you're trying to keep the brain for, from losing oxygen, am I right? Or you understand me? Are you holding that high gravity? Are you holding up high G? Or have you lost consciousness and your airplane is crashing? I think uh, by the look of you, I think we need to listen to an inspiring uh, uh, song about airplanes. Am I right? Is, do we need to do that? Vysotsky or uh, no? Yes, definitely, right? At least one person wants to listen to that uh, song, so. All right. Yes, you already crashed. So let me uh, show you. Let's see if I can find it easily. We'll make a short pause. Very short pause to regain consciousness.
It's only three minutes, less than that, okay, guys? By the way, so you know, Arkady Etkin was uh, a pilot. Yes? In case you are confused what that was, it expresses many things. First of all, that I'm very angry. Secondly, it thinks tomorrow you and the machine will be working in one, right? And who said that the machine is not wanting and will not work for us and that machine is your brain, right? Back to the lecture. So important exponential limits, guys. We begin uh, trying to understand why exponential functions are so interesting, so amazing. A good Russian man never goes a day without tea or alcohol. Consider the following drinking habit. Begin with a glass of tea, an identical glass of rum. Take a sip from the tea and then replace, pour back uh, from the alcohol until the glass is full again. Mix it thoroughly and then take another sip. And you continue doing so until both beakers are empty. The question guys, what is the probability that the very last glass, the very last droplet you drink is water or is tea, whatever you call it, okay? Let me try to explain how to approach such a problem and to try to make it precise. So here, imagine that initially we have only three molecules in the beaker containing tea and three molecules of alcohol. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to sample a molecule out of the beaker labeled T and then replace it with one molecule in the second beaker labeled R. Are you clear guys? We're only, when we take a sip, we imagine we're picking one molecule out. In this case, we have very few molecules, three and three. So what is the probability the very last molecule removed is a molecule of T. So it's either molecule one, two or three. So let's calculate the probability that molecule one is the last molecule to be removed. In other words, let's, let's consider the probability that molecule one survives. What's the probability that it survives the first sampling, guys? I, I begin sampling from here. What's the probability of surviving? Well, there are three options. What's the probability of surviving? Help me. Two out of three. Correct, look at it. Two, it must be the two molecules. One of two molecules is removed, but this one isn't. So it's two out of three. What's the probability that it survives second round, you see? So here, one molecule from the alcohol replaced the one that was removed. I color them green because I only focus on molecule one. What's the probability of surviving again? You were not inspired by that song, I see. No, not one third, not one half. How is it one half? There are three, uh, three molecules here. Either this is removed or this is removed or this is removed. There are three possibilities for, to be, for molecules to be removed to survive the other two molecules, uh, uh, one of the other two molecules had to be removed. The answer is of course, two over three. Two over three again. Guys, do you understand why it's two over three? It's, uh, I mean, uh, of course it's probability, of course you haven't studied it, but my God, right? 
either molecule one is removed or molecule two is removed or molecule three is removed. The only way for molecule one to survive is that the removed molecule is two or three. Two possibilities out of three that it survives. Yes? What's the probability of surviving the next one? Look at it, you see, I replace it. Now again, I have three molecules. What's the probability of surviving for the third time? Survived once, survived twice, surviving for the third time, it is two over three again. You all see that, guys, I, I have only, what, three, four people answering it. Is it, is it hard? You're not telling me that this is hard here. Two over three. What's the probability of surviving now, again, for the fourth time? Well, I mean, you, rep you replace one molecule, uh, you see, look what happens. When I, once I remove one molecule of the tea, I replace it by a molecule of alcohol. Two thirds, look at it here, it can still survive two thirds. Yes? What's the probability of surviving now uh, for, the, uh, for the next round? Now it is one half. Yes? Do you all see that? One half. So what it, it, this is, a, this I, I'm not going to teach here, but uh, what we have is that the probability of survival for molecule one through all those rounds is two thirds times two thirds times two thirds uh, times, you see we have three of them, one, two, three, and then times two thirds times one half. Yes? So what do we get? We get that the probability is, uh, the probability is two, thir two over three cubed times one third. Next round, let's see about next round. Let's do it uh, for four molecules, guys, right? We, we obviously have many molecules. So we're building up to the general case where you have lots and lots of molecules. Yes, so let's see. Here is uh, one beaker. Let's consider it having four molecules, right? So this is molecule one. And here we have uh, four molecules, good. What's the probability of surviving first round? There are four molecules, guys, help me. What's the probability you remove uh, from, from first beaker? What's the probability of survival? Three quarters. Yes, you all see why three quarters? Because there are four molecules. Yeah, I can remove any three except for molecule one, right? For it to survive first round. So it's three quarters. You see that, guys? So we have three quarters. Now I'm going to replace one of the molecules. So I'm replacing one of the molecules here that represents replacement, right? Now we are at round two. What's the probability of surviving again? Three quarters, amazing. So it's three quarters. Now I uh, replace one of the removed molecules. What's the probability of surviving again? Same. Okay, what's the probability of surviving now? Help me with each stage. What's the probability? Three quarters. There is nothing to replace anymore, right? So it means one molecule was lost, nothing came to replace it. What's the probability of survival? Oh, good, Elazar. Adno it tosh, right? Two thirds. Good, I will make you speak Russian. Two thirds. Good, what's the probability after I have two thirds? Now another molecule is lost. What's the probability now? One half. Amazing, one half. Good, now let's look what happens here guys. So we have, uh, we have this. Now I can cross away you see, I can cross away three and three, two and uh, two. And so what do I get? 
the probability that molecule one survives is three quarters to the power of four multiplied by one quarter. Now, by symmetry, guys, the probability that molecule two survives is the same, and the probability that molecule three survives is the same, or molecule four survives. I'm, I'm interested in the probability that one of the molecules initially in the first beaker survives to the last round. So do you see that by symmetry, uh, that probability is four times this result. Do you agree? Because it's uh, this result added four times. So the same result for molecule one, for molecule two, for molecule three. I could focus on any of the molecules initially in the beaker and carry this procedure. And its probability of surviving all the rounds to the last is the same. Do you agree? So the probability of, uh, this, is, this is the T, the probability that T is to survive last, that the last uh, drink I take is that of T, is three over four to the power of four. But here I have very few molecules. You agree? Very few molecules. Now, if, this, is, this is the probability when I have four molecules, okay? What if I have uh, five molecules? What's the probability of T? Can you guess without me carrying out that calculation? If you have five molecules, what do you think is going to be the probability? Four over five to the power of five. Very good. Test it for yourself, guys. Four over five to the power of five. But do you agree that a beaker has many molecules, millions of them, billions of them, yes? So what we simulate is we take the limit as the number of molecules get larger and larger and larger. So basically, if you have n molecules, you can just establish this, right? So the probability that, uh, or that T is the last molecule removed is the limit as n goes to infinity of n minus one over n to the power of n, right? Also known as limit where n goes to infinity of one minus one over n to the power n. Now, any idea guys, like you look at this limit, you don't have to obviously know it. I'm just saying what, what if you had to answer this limit equals to what value? What does this limit equal to? Well, could it be E? Remember what is E, guys? E is roughly 2.71. Can probability exceed one? It cannot be E. All right, and, but if you had to answer, guys, uh, what, what would you say? Or you just uh, don't want to answer, it's too much for you. Okay, radical two. All right, no, never mind, that's good, never mind. Let's continue. Okay, I was, I was waiting for the number one. Could it possibly, look at it, one over n approaches zero, so could it be one to, to bigger powers? Maybe the answer is one. Now, of course, let's look at, uh, at this calculation, guys. So there is, are you ready? Are you ready for the final G-force today? It's heavy and hard. Take a deep breath, press your stomach. We're going to uh, dive. Or we're going to first go up, and then we're gonna dive. Don't lose consciousness. Guys, we're going to play with the derivative. I always, you know, my favorite game when I was young guys uh, was to buy plastic soldier, soldiers and bury them in a military uh, ceremony, you know, in, in the rectangles. So yes, graves are prepared, but die with honor. 
here is the situation, guys. If the function, uh, if the derivative of the function, think of this f of x as e to the x. You can think uh, f of x uh, as e to the x if you're afraid of obstruction, right? So the derivative of the function is itself means that if I take this limit, look at it, then I get, if I take this limit, then I get the function itself. Do you agree? Very easy, right? If I apply the definition, I get the function itself. So I can, what does the H do? It means that if there is a very small difference between uh, this point and that point, essentially I can write the fraction to equal F of X. I don't need to do anything extra. Yes. So here I have f of x plus h minus f of x over h is approximately f of x. Guys, before I continue, I'm going to solve for f of x plus h in terms of everything else. Could you carry out and verify that this is the calculation that you get? Could you, before actually, I'm not gonna show you. From this equation, f of x plus h equals to what? Simplify it. Move everything else to the other side. I just want to see on my left, f of x plus h. Well, just pretty, um, not sure what I'm reading there. Not clear. Very simple guys, algebra, look at it. Can you solve for this part? Can you tell me what this part equals to? What do you mean A Safa? Here it is. Guys, basic algebra, nothing more. Nothing more than basic algebra. I multiply by H, I have F of X plus H minus F of X is H times F of X. That means that F of X plus H, just move the, this across, it's F of X plus H F of X, which if I factor, it's one plus H times F of X. Now here is where I need you to think. Like this was not supposed to be anything to think. It's immediate, right? The calculation is immediate. You understand guys, uh, if you look at this expression, it's supposed to tell you something. Now, what does it tell me? This is just a number. It tells me that uh, here it is, that, that a number, f at a number is equal to one, I call it a small step, times the function of the same number minus the small step. You understand what I mean? I can call this, I can call this here u if I want to, and then what is this? This is X plus H minus H. So that is just uh, U minus H. It's called recursion, right? I'm just saying that if I want to know what is the value of this function at this number, I can uh, multiply by one plus the step that I take back. And I take the step back. That's the hard part, guys. That's what I mean by I'm trying to teach you guys to interpret rather than just to stare at a formula and see x's. I want you to think about what it means when you read it, right? You're not reading symbols, you're trying to gain the meaning. So this, if I write it in terms of my previous letters, that means f of a number, you look at it, the meaning of x is different here, but I say f of a number equals to one plus h f of the number minus the step. Now, why am I going to, um, why is that very helpful? Look at it, I can divide the interval from X to zero into microscopic steps. Those are supposed to be microscopic. X over N is the size of the step. 
In other words, divide this into million pieces. Uh, the one millionth piece is extremely small, so each step is very near, right? And then I can apply that uh, recursion. Are you following me, guys? That's very hard, I think. At least uh, I know you will have problem understanding it. Look at it. I begin here. I walk one step back. I walk one step back. I'm just trying to go to zero because zero, I know the answer. E to the zero is one, you understand? The, the, the function at zero is one. I'm, I'm walking to the one place where I am at home. And I have this recursive formula, look at it. So what is f of x? It's approximately one plus x over n times the function at uh, the previous point at here. Now, what is this function at the previous point? It's multiplied by an extra one plus x over n and evaluate the function at that point. That's what the, this expression tells me to do. You understand guys, if you do not just, if you can make it, uh, if you can rewrite it and make it look like this, then it tells you that you, then, then this, this phrase can be just written much simpler like this. Just uh, F at some point is one plus the step times F of the prior step, the prior position where you could be, right? And that allows me to walk back to zero and, uh, and, uh, and evaluate this function. So then I continue walking, look at it, I, I walk. And so what is f of x? It's one plus x over n to the power of n. And here it's f of zero. So f of x is approximately one plus x over n to the power of n. And of course, uh, that's more and more precise if n is going to infinity. The larger the n, the more I divide, the less uh, I take a step back and the more the derivative formula approximation is correct. Do you follow? Yes, are you with me guys? Confirm, say yes that you follow or no, you need some explanation. That's what I'm trying to teach you guys, not how to take derivatives using a long formula. I'm trying to teach you to look at this formula and realize what it means to read it. To people that understand mathematics very deeply, mathematics speaks. It actually talks. What is it saying? Do you understand? Confirm if you do. Yes, no. Please don't kill me. Uh, professor, I got up to where we got, how we got uh, f, uh, f x plus h is equal to f of x times h plus one. The other part is confusing where it's in symbols. f of x is equal to one plus h, f x minus h. No, but you see, why is this? You see, guys, so thank you, uh, Jasper. You see, look at it, guys. You understood how to get this equation, yes? But the reason, the reason you might be confused, you see this. This is the, you see the reason you might feel confused is that you are too, you're paying too much attention to the symbol, right? Forget about the symbol, uh, tell me what's the meaning. The meaning is that, uh, you see, x plus h is some number. So what you're saying is that the function of the number is uh, one plus a small step, this is the step that you take back, uh, times the number before it, you see? So if I divide this, uh, this interval and I start at some number, I can recall, I call it uh, X. I can call anything I want by anything. You see, I'm just giving a different label. I'm not saying that, that this is, I, this is just a statement. This is saying that this function has the property that its value at one number equals to, um, it's related to what it was equal to one uh, step back. You understand? Take a step back and multiply by one plus H and you get the expression at your current number. So for example, I'm not sure if that it, it helps. Look at it. Uh, imagine that I want to evaluate, imagine that I divided, uh, imagine that for example, that uh, F of X was equal to, Imagine that we took only three steps. That's what this is saying, okay? Imagine we took only uh, three steps. Uh, that's all we had to do here. Yeah. 
or four steps, right? So here uh, you are at X, here you are at zero. What is the size of your step? The size of your step is X over four, yes? So I, I, my goal is to jump all the way to one point where I know the value, right? I know that F of zero is equal to one, but I don't know what is F of X, okay? So if this formula were completely true, it, this, this, this expression tells me that F of X is what? It's one plus the size of the step, the, the size of my jump, in this case, one over X times uh, four, F of the number minus the, the, the step that I take. So this means what? What does this mean? This means that now I'm standing here. Right? Once I'm standing here, I can use that same thing. It, it tells me that I, I can figure out what the value is here by figuring it, what's the value in here and multiplying by the size of the step plus one. That's what the formula is telling. Are you following, Jasper? Just, just it's a little abstract, but not too abstract. You should be able to see it, guys. Do you follow me? Example, but but you see, uh, you say example. I'm limited with what I can say with it, with examples. I mean, I can construct a different recursive procedure, right? So uh, it's a recursive procedure, guys. Imagine that I say something like this. So I say, uh, I say that uh, um, a one. Or say I say something like this. I say f of one is equal to one, right? And then I say that f of n is equal to, is equal to n minus one squared, right? I'm just creating a procedure, right? So then how would you find what is f of two, right? What is f of two? f of two is simply, uh, it's simply what it's in f of uh, let's say times f of n minus one right something like this. Let me actually change this. It might be simpler like this. It's equal to n squared times f of n minus one, right? So what is f of two? It tells me what I need to do is I need to take two squared and multiply by f of two minus one. That's what this procedure tells me to do. By f of two minus one, it's just two squared times f of one, which means it's just two squared. Agreed? Now, what is uh, what is f of three? Okay, but, but if you just use this procedure, you see, you need to walk all the way back to the one point you know. So f of three is what? It is three squared f of two. You agree? Now, what is f, what is that? This is uh, three squared times two squared f of one. And what is f of one? This is one. So that's just basically three squared times two squared. You understand? So I evaluate by going back to the one value I know because I have a formula that tells me how do I modify my, uh, how do I evaluate my new, my new point in terms of the old one? Are you with me? Recursion. So what happens in here? What's the recursion here? Look at it, guys. It's the, it's the art of uh, looking at this formula and understanding what the recursion would be. Remember what from geometry? I don't think you learned that limit. limit. Maybe you remember recursion. So this this formula guys if you look at it and uh, and don't look at the symbols it is saying that the value of the function at this new number is equal uh, to one plus a step times the value of the function at a previous number it's just a different recursion are you with me and the only thing it's not precise because this formula is not exactly precise h has to be very small so that means that if i uh, if i uh, think of it if, if if h is very small then uh, the function at some value x, it's equal to one plus the size of my step, how much I step back, times the uh, of, uh, function at the previous value, at the previous step, you understand? So if I divide this interval into a huge n, then uh, I make the size of the step very small. 
and that allows this uh, recursion to be almost true. The smaller the step, the more true it is. You see that, guys? That's what this, this is saying. This formula is saying the value of the function at one number is one plus the size of the step, the value uh, of the function at the prior step. Here we go. I want to walk all the way to zero. So what do I begin? I say, okay, one plus uh, at, at x, one plus x over n, the function at the previous step. Now I cannot calculate this. You see here it's in red. It's, uh, I can take one step back. And when I take one step back, I multiply by one plus x over n. And here I took two steps back. Once I take n steps back, you should see it's one plus x over n to the power of n. And finally, that would bring me to zero. So f of x is approximately one plus x over n to the power of n. You see guys, the difference that why do I understand it so easily? The difference is this, I don't look at the symbols. I just look at the symbols and ask myself, what's the meaning, right? And the meaning is very quickly giving me those formulas. F of x is one plus x over n to the power of n, where this step must be as small as possible. So they, that means that uh, if I push n to infinity, that will make this step very small. And that means that this limit is e to the power of x. You understand that is the limit for e to the power of x. Calculate please if you understood what is, uh, what is a, b, c, and d. Here is your limit, right? For any x, it's this thing. What is a, b, c, and d? And then uh, if you, want to stay after class, we can talk more about it. Okay, is it is it one look at it guys? Do you understand this uh, formula? What's happening here? Look at it. It's one plus a number over n to the power of n when the number goes to infinity will be e to that number. What is this? What is this? What is this? What is this? Thank you, Jasprit, exactly. E to the power of five is A. What is B? Um, careful, look at, look at the values here, it's minus here. So what does it make it? Yes, very good, E to the minus three. You see why, because Yes, very good, because uh, it's plus minus three as the power. Exactly, Jeffrey. So what about C, guys? C, do you recognize C? C is that uh, thing that we were seeking with the alcohol, right? With the alcohol and the, the beaker, it's e to the minus one. So the answer to the previous question is that e to the minus one. In probability, guys, and if you wonder what probability is, any propagation, you can, you can read, um, a quantum mechanics book, if you want to write, uh, it will be probability is at the basis of um, reality, at least according to those theories, right? Clear? So here are the answers. And they hear, if you want to, I did it with my students, maybe next class, we can ask, um, when is your birthday? You can see that e to the x has to do with your birthday, if you want to. Mm 
Yeah, why not? You can leave it as a negative exponent. So guys, before I finish today's lecture, if I fi before I finish today's lecture, guys, it was not hard what I said. I hope you understand it. Do you? Do you understand what I did, guys? The, and what am I trying to, again, push in this class? It's not an easy thing to push. I don't care if you can uh, find the derivative of, I don't know, I mean, here is, uh, is you, you might think like this. Here is x squared. The derivative of that is 2x. And you can go like this. I understood it, right? No. Right? Uh, first, if you don't prove it, you don't understand it. Secondly, it's meaningless. Nobody cares that, uh, that you can do it. Computers can do it. But what calculus gives you is a sort of ability to think, a certain philosophy, right? A sort of approach to life. That's what I hope you gain from it. And uh, naturally, when you apply it, you need to uh, be able to derive formulas that nobody ever talked about, which means that when you read something in calculus, you understand the meaning, right? And that's an example of what you can gain if you understand meaning rather than just memorize something you can figure out uh, complete formulas that you never saw before. It's possible, or at least understand this process. Good. Well, if you want to go rest, if not, uh, we can stay a little bit and maybe work on the, ma on the math. I can answer maybe about e, e to the X. And uh, yes. <clears throat>